It feel, feels a bit odd probably being the uh, least qualified person in the room standing up here talking to you about security and planning and design. And um, from the outset, what I want to say is that I've got no intention of talking to you about the sort of technical aspects, going into a lot of technical detail, but it's just really to talk about the, uh, the sort of end user and uh, layman's perspective on the real business benefits of security and early stage, planning it in, and really the increasing public perception as well. And even in my sort of relatively short time with Canary Wharf Group, there's an increasing business and public appetite for security, and we, we increasingly get challenged down to some very fine detail on what security we're, we're providing for people. So um, from the outset, th this is done against the backdrop of uh, a threat level severe. So uh, give or take a, a few rises are critical. We've been, at, we've been at threat level severe since 29th of August 2014. And it's going to stay that way. We all know it's going to stay that way unless, of course, it, it goes up. So that is the real um, sort of backdrop from what we're working against. So we have... Um, uh, you know, hundreds, uh, uh, hundreds of live operations going on at any one time. The, we're told the security services are watching up to 3,000 people and that undoubtedly, despite all that work, attacks will occur. And as someone was saying to us the other day, if there's a 52-year-old man called Adrian Elms that was born in Kent, will go and uh, run people down at Westminster Bridge and murder and maim people and then go on to murder a police officer within the Palace of Westminster, then how do really the security services and the police um, stand a chance in preventing all attacks, and of course they won't. And that's that said very much with the appreciation that, that I believe, and in my view, we very much have the, the best security service and the best counter-terrorism policing capabilities in the world, and the way that's joined up and the way that the information is, uh, is passed out to the public sector and the private sector is without doubt the best in the world. But it's uh, clearly a huge challenge, and... Um, we're, uh, uh, one of the events we're hosting next week is the launch of Step Change by the Metropolitan Police, but with a national CT network. And this is all about security in crowded places, security in business. And it's very much one of the key elements of that launch is going to be very much uh, about the expectation of business and the private sector to have measures in place which is going to manage risk and, and vulnerability. So just moving on to some uh, explanation then about, about Canary uh, Wharf. Uh, what you see in front of you is, is two sort of architectural achievements, really, and um, this is probably the only bit of culture that I'm going to refer to in my, in my entire presentation. So you've got the, um, the Royal Naval College, or what, is the, what was the Royal Naval College, built in 1696 by Sir Christopher Wren, and in the background you've got the Canary Wharf Estate, which was built about 300 years later. And the challenge, uh, the challenge for us is is not about will an attack occur, what will we do to, when an attack occurs, but it's what measures we take to mitigate that, to mitigate casualties, mitigate damage, and return to normality, which is an increasingly uh, important part of the business conscience as well, especially after the borough market attacks, where they very keenly observed some of those businesses in there who were, who were closed for up to 11 days after the, uh, after the attack. So just a bit of history then. That's... Um, that's a pretty poor picture. I'm not going to dwell on that because it's the only one I could find with uh, more than about 10 pixels that didn't have somebody's branding across it. So that's, that's Canary Wharf in 1987, just after DLR opened. And it, and it is what it is. There was no work there. Docks had closed in 1980. It was derelict. Um, and through a variety of enterprise zones, London De uh, Doctrines Development Corporations and others, it came, um, it started to get redeveloped by what was then Olympia in York and started to get built on in the, in the late 1980s. So that's Canary Wharf today. So it's an estate which is about 130 acres in uh, size. And we have 120,000 people coming to work there every day. There's more bankers that work there than uh, anywhere else in Europe uh, at the moment. Uh, but they, uh, so it, it's a pretty key part of the UK infrastructure and economy. There's 26 trading floors on the estate, and each one of those trading floors turn over about a million pounds every 15 seconds. And as, uh, above that, what you can't see, uh, because it's mainly underground, is we also have the third largest shopping centre within the M25. So there's almost 350 shops, bars and restaurants there. We've got 160,000 visitors every day coming onto this state. And that's on a patch of ground which is 1,250 metres east to west and 600 metres north to south. So it's pretty challenging. To put that in context, that's more than the population of cities such, such as um, Exeter or, uh, or Cambridge. We've got um, four million, uh, about 4 million vehicles uh, entering the state every year. 
Uh, the year on year, the amount of private vehicles that are entering the estate is going down in keeping with probably the rest of London and, and the rest of mo most of the urban environments. But the amount of vans deliveries uh, are going up because there's just an increasing appetite for people who are working long hours to have all this tat delivered to their, to their desks. And, and it's just a, it is a constant security problem for us, a massive increase. It's not just about security, it's about the transportation, sustainability and the effect on the, uh, on the environment. So that's where we are at the moment. This is some CGI images of where we're going to be in a few years' time, the 130 acres, moving to residential and further commercial. So it feels like London, it looks like London, but it's actually all private property. And the most um, evident manifestation of that is the, is the um, control on vehicle access. So out of those four million vehicles here at the end of the estate, we would have security that stop and engage with about a million of those vehicles. Uh, it's all done in a, in a, in a fairly professional, fairly uh, at least intrusive way. And actually, out of those million uh, vehicles that we engage with every year, we get about a dozen complaints uh, from that, which is minimal. So there is clearly an appetite for people who feel safe. And, we very, and, and again, we, we get challenged on this regularly by the big corporates there about the fact you might get a security director ring up saying, well, I drove in last week and I wasn't stopped once at the barriers. What's going on? We constantly, they watch us like hawks. And this is, and, and, as they do in the building design, building construction and the sort of standard of foot, fit outs. So we're responsible for sort of all aspects of uh, security and, and traffic management in the state. We also, we also work closely with the transport providers. So we've got the Docklands Light Railway, uh, Canary Wharf uh, Tube Station. They bring in about 98,000 passengers a day between them on, onto the estate. And uh, we've got Crossrail, which uh, the actual station infrastructure, is construction stage is finished there. Uh, the last I heard that, there's probably a load of people in this room that will be able to tell me better than that, better than me, but the last I heard, this is going to go live in about mid-December for the London branch and then uh, onto the route, main route, in uh, further into 2019. Uh, but all of this, this sort of success story, um, that, that I sort of outlined to you could have been very different because um, in 1996 that was the scene at South Quay. So it's 20 years ago last February. Tragically, two people were killed in the explosion. It caused over £150 million worth of damage and significant disruption to the financial services industry. Um, so this is always referred to the Canary Wharf uh, bomb, which, which we get a bit sensitive about because actually it wasn't on the Canary Wharf. It was to the south of us. And... Um, just off, off the estate, but, but there is good reason to believe that actually the ASU that went to plant that bomb were deterred by the vehicle barriers and carried on to the south and planted it in South Key, near, now South Key DLR station. Um, what's uh, less known is that four years before that, on the 15th of November 1992, the IRA put down a 1.6 tonne bomb pretty much outside one Canada Square underneath the Docklands Light Railway Bridge. And that was actually seen by one of our security officers who went along there, challenged the ASU that put the bomb down uh, they pulled a gun on him, tried to fire it. The revolver was faulty, so it didn't go off, fortunately for him. Um, and, and, they, and they made their getaway. He got caught by the police in, in North London. The police came along and made that bomb safe. But if that had gone off, the whole image and reputation and concept of Canary Wharf, which, to be frank, was struggling at the time. It was a bit of a white elephant. We didn't have the tube station. The DLR didn't really go anywhere. People didn't really want to come there. If that bomb had gone off, apart from the human cost of uh, the injury and, and uh, misery and devastation, that could well have been the end of that particular uh, project. So it's as, it's as important as that uh, for us. That security officer, by the way, is still working for us. He's a, he's a duty manager today in charge of 160 staff on the estate. And um, he, was, uh, he was rewarded with a framed print of uh, Canary Wharf. For, it, for his efforts, so, so he's still, 20, 20, uh, 25 years later, he's still moaning about that every time I, uh, I do his appraisal. So this is our operating context, it's not just about counter-terrorism, it's about the, I'm trying to avoid the word holistic, but I feel I'm going to use it quite a few times, because it, it is about that, it's not just about the great systems or the great people, but it needs to be a combination of the both, it's no good having fantastic lockdown procedures, fantastic lift procedures, fantastic HVM, if you've got a, low, a demotivated, poorly trained, uninformed guard force. And conversely, there's no point in having a, a ninja guard force if you just don't back that up with some of the technical infrastructure uh, um, and, and the investment in the security systems. So um, very broadly, we horizon scan all the time. Um, we're looking at threat levels of volume of attacks. And it's essential to have the police and the CPNI, CPNI on side. And we've got really good working relationships with, uh, with both of those agencies. We are an iconic site, we're a crowded place, and within that framework, we identify risk, uh, analyze risk, 
evaluate it and deal with it in the most appropriate way. And that doesn't always mean putting up huge HVM outside a building, really intrusive, overly intrusive security systems. It means taking a far more nuanced approach to the security, overall security threat and looking at, looking at it in the rounds and see how we can mitigate those threats. And some of them, you know, some of the threats we accept. There's an, there has to be an acceptance. So very broadly, the threats to the estate as we see them at the moment, uh, the vehicle attack as a weapon, use of vehicle as a weapon, because it, it's easy and it's very difficult to detect. Uh, a low-tech marauding attack using knives or, or other sort of sharp, uh, sharp implements. Um, thirdly, an IED, and we saw another manifestation of that from the sort of unattended package in Parsons Green, which we hadn't seen for some time, which is clearly regarded as a, as a, as a failed attack, but we haven't seen that methodology for a while. And uh, a high-level marauding attack, which is sort of down the, the, lift, the last of our important list at the moment in terms of sort of IEDs and firearms. But I say that with a, with a touch of caution, because we all know uh, the difficulty of getting uh, firearms available in the UK. But it, it's only a matter of time before, before we can stop saying that, I, I think, because of the increasing uh, crossover into the criminal world, prison radicalisation, and increasing evidence that those people on the CT world are crossing over into criminal gangs, drug dealers, uh, armed robbery gangs and, and, the, and the rest of it, and, and it's only a matter of time. And in my, in my former life, I was in a, a police firearms unit. It was almost comical, and this is going back a few years when I had a proper job um, before I sort of spent the last few years driving a desk in the, in the police. We'd, uh, we'd be in an operation in, in a London borough, and we'd be following um, a, 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 an organisation, if you can call it an organisation, of, of people aspiring to commit a terrorist act, and they'd be scouring the whole country looking for guns. They'd be going to Manchester, Liverpool, up to Scotland looking for guns, and they couldn't find them, couldn't get them anywhere. And yet I had some colleagues who were sat 600 yards away watching a house which is full of guns, uh, which they are renting out for criminal shootings, armed robberies, and, and that sort of, uh, uh, that sort of um, uh, enterprise. But it's only a matter of time before those two will, uh, will come together, uh, not, I think. So, just going to sort of more business-specific operating context, we've got an increasing reg regulatory landscape. And by that, I mean there's been a few influential reports now that have mentioned security and design. And a couple of examples of that is a recommendation 32 in the Harris report talks about increased consideration towards bollards or other measures for pedestrian protection. We've got a uh, recommendation, recommendation 122 in the same report that talks about the government should uh, work with the police CPNI and others uh, to uh, consider the, the introduction of a statutory obligation for the resilience of de uh, design into new buildings. So it is increasingly on, our, uh, on the horizon, and it's certainly within the spirit of the recommendations of the, of the National Policy Planning Policy Framework that we should uh, be looking at creating environments which are free of crime disorder and the fear of crime. And we've got increasingly business, increasing business expectations, to be frank. So when we have our commercial pitches trying to attract large tenants to come to the Canary Wharf estate to sell them a building or leasing a building, usually there's only three people uh, in that pitch. So it's usually uh, the, the, our chairman. It's usually somebody who knows about technical design, about the HVAC systems, about lifts and escalators and that sort of thing. And then it's either my boss, who, who's the director of security there, or myself in there, because they want to know about security and they want to, they go into that in, in some level of detail, even at the exploratory stages. And then increasingly asking us about what you are doing for us to keep our people safe and the business operating. And it's not good enough anymore to just sort of say, well, we're Canary Wharf Group, and we've done this for 27 years, and we've never, uh, we've never sort of... Uh, messed up yet because they want to know about some um, they want to know about the tangible evidence that you're qualified to that standard so that's why on the business continuity side we've just gone through uh, ISO 22301 and that's why you know we're going to uh, work on the uh, Sabre scheme in conjunction with the BRE to go through that to give that tangible reassurance that we've got that security of risk management in in place and also from the uh, business expectation, there's an increasing view of where that duty of care for employees starts and finishes. So now we're seeing the big corporates, when events occur in holiday locations or events where people are socialising, they see it as their responsibility to push the information out, to do, to do a quick poll, check their people are safe, and if they don't get positive replies, then to start going through the system to check that their people are safe. And if they see that when they're socialising, when they're on holiday, that equates multifold Multi, multiple times back into the business environment. So there, there's a huge em emphasis now on, on what you're doing to keep our people safe. And quite frankly, there's increasing competition. So at Canary Wharf Group, um, 
and this is a long time before Brexit, a lot of the big banks are moving people out to crack off Warsaw, Dublin, places like that, especially for the backstage functions. So a lot of the big banks are actually going into the, in the landlord business themselves and they're having multi-tenancy buildings. So in one Canada Square, we've got 200 separate companies operating from, the, from that, that building. And there is increasing competition. And, and you do get to the stage where you do wonder where the next big deal is going to come from, where we're going to house five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people in one place, in one building in London. And I just wonder whether those days have started to be, uh, to be numbered. And we all, got, we all get questions at a really early stage about standoff, blast protection, and risk mitigation, especially for trading floors. There's a big um, uh, trade-off on the trading floors because the companies want them to be lower down because they don't want their people they're paying £2 million a year to to spend time in the lifts or on the stairs going up and down to the 10th, 11th, 12th floor. So they often be on a low floor. But if there's a blast in or near or underneath that trading floor, that effectively stops that bank's business and takes them out of business for, for X number of hours, X number of days. So they want to know specifically around there what we're doing around standoff vehicle mitigation in the wider environment, not just in, in, in terms of the, the, the blast protection for that building. And there's increasing... Um, individual awareness. So there's an awareness of personal safety which hasn't previously existed. And we've seen some of the, how vigilant people are and perhaps hypervigilant about the fear of terrorism. So we had the taxi crash in Covent Garden last night, which immediately went viral on social media. We had the exhibition road incident with the Uber driver. Then immediately everyone's assumption was it was a, it was a terrorist attack. So people are hypervigilant. And we're getting questions about things like, why aren't you searching my handbag? Why have you only got low barriers? Um, at one Canada Square, which we just spent almost a million pounds on putting in 1.8 metre barriers, because people expect that now, whereas a few years ago they'd have regarded that as an intrusive measure, which they didn't particularly want in their office block. Now, if we haven't got those six-foot barriers in, in new buildings, they're asking why we haven't got them and asking some difficult questions about them. And then there's, uh, there's no doubt that there's also the public perception of a, of a, a safe place. So people are increasingly making lifestyle choices about where to work, live, socialise, based on some security considerations as well. And they'd look at that in more detail than they ever have done before. And this is a, it's a bit of a, probably a bit of a flippant slide, but there's a serious point to that. So he's got 42 million followers. Uh, I don't know how many are out of curiosity or, or how many are out of sort of uh, just real, real interest. But there is a serious point to that in that there is, a, there is differing international views of the UK security situation. So I was in, uh, I was in Dallas a few weeks ago at a conference at a, um, conference being uh, delivered a presentation about Islamist extremist threat and, and generally I thought they were talking about Europe, talking about UK and Europe and I genuinely thought that I, I, I never had been to the UK because it was a war zone, there were 750 no-go zones, we were on the front line of the uh, fight against terror and we were regularly being terrorised in our beds by, by these people. So it didn't bear any relation to the truth but that actually doesn't matter because there was people there representing 7,000 sites around the world who'd got that in their mind about this is the situation in, in uh, continental Europe and the UK around security. So I'll put these up there. I'm not going to go through it in detail because the text is fairly small and it's, uh, it's a fairly boring slide. But that just this slide here is in our business, is in our business um, policy for the group. So security is intrinsically linked into the business uh, uh, policy of the, of the group and our group business plan about keeping people safe, supporting the growth of the group through provision of best-in-class security, resilient services. And it is absolutely fundamental to the, comp to the policy of the, of, the, of the entire company. And this just talks through a sort of risk management process. And I know it's pretty much the feature for the whole day, really. But what I mean by that is that we can go through that entire process about establishing the context, identifying, analysing, evaluating, treating the risk. And we have got those options at the bottom. So it's not all about taking, turning places into looking like a prison. Sometimes you might accept the risk. So with the increasing um, appetite for open plan offices, for example, open plan offices clearly uh, is not the best place to be if you, have a if you have a marauding threat in that building. It's clearly not. No one's going to argue with that. But we also know we're not going to change that preference for open plan uh, working and open plan design. So it's a risk we have to accept, which is then mitigated by, by um, effective security further down the building and outside the building to prevent that becoming a reality in the first place. And this is just an example of one of the processes we went through after Westminster. So a lot of the, we've got a lot of uh, pedestrian protection, HVM on the estate. To be honest, most of it is configured against VBIEDs, so against the vehicle-borne explosion, and not so much against vehicle attacks to weapon because that's something that's come through 
uh, probably in Western Europe since 2014, although it was in the Middle East probably uh, 10 years before that. So again, this is just, this is just a very outline example, a very um, broad outline example. We identified the risk. We then assessed some, um, we assessed the, the uh, vulnerabilities around the estate. Uh, we assessed that it wasn't acceptable, it wasn't up to our standards in terms of pedestrian protection. We got a lot of outdoor events. During the summer, we have concerts, we got transport hubs, got, got uh, thousands of people out on the streets now socialising in the evening. So we identified uh, uh, seven significant vulnerabilities and we're working to, uh, to, to rectify those. And it's not all about the PAS 68 stuff, it's not all about the, the installation of those PAS 68 uh, blockers although it would be if we had the opportunity to do it again. This is, this is about taking common sense, practical measures um, in, with a holistic approach, which may mean you, take this, you, you reduce vehicle speed, it may mean you put traffic calming measures in place, put chicanes in place, because if you can actually mitigate the maximum speed that vehicle can reach in any given area, then perhaps you can um, step back slightly in some of the really intrusive protection and pedestrian areas, perhaps. It's a, it's a, it's a view. Uh, so this is the overall security um, uh, posture, which we sort of judge in, in, in the rounds. Um, so a robust security regime at the perimeter of an area may mean that you can scale back slightly on the, on the protection measures for individual buildings. It may mean that. Some companies will come to uh, Canary Wharf, they will audit us, and they will conduct their own security audits, and they will go away, and they will rationalise the minimising the protection to their building on the basis they've got this outer protection, other companies won't, and, uh, and they want both. And broadly, the, uh, the US companies will want both. Some of the Central European companies will look at the outer protection, they'll look at the 1800 CCTV cameras, they'll look at our rising barriers, which come up in, in one second and can stop a seven and a half ton truck, and they'll be happy with that, and they will sort of scale down their protection on the, uh, on the sort of inner, inner area, as it were. Um, but the other thing uh, for us is, is, again, with the overarching approach, is that we're very, we're very careful about communications we put out. So on our brochures, on the commercial brochures, we will often put in subtle pictures of uh, security, whether that's technical features around the cameras, whether that's some of the HVM, um, whether that's security officers, explosive uh, search dog trained security officers, or something else which will just plant in those people's minds if they are using that for any hostile means or, you know, to be frank, for commercial purposes on the on the other side, we will put in those, those security-minded uh, communications. Because the fact is that in all the attacks, or th th there's credible evidence that there's been some at least some hostile reconnaissance. And that ranges from the rudimentary on the day of the attack, just going along having a quick look before a detonation or before launching an attack. Or it may be something which is, goes on for weeks and is really, really advanced, as we saw in some of the, uh, the disrupted plot at Shepherds Bush Police Station, where they conducted in many, many months of really sophisticated hostile reconnaissance. But all of this is, is immensely off-putting, as is the chance of, of, of being, you know, one in four chance of being stopped if you drive in to the estate. So I'm conscious of the time. So um, we've, we're also, I mean, linking with a holistic approach, we're also talking about the, the cyber threat as well, robust um, cyber procedures. So, one Canada Square, to be honest with you, one Canada Square is that it looks uh, sort of glass and, and still and shiny, but it's probably the oldest, uh, oldest building in the UK of that height now. So it's pretty much steam driven in terms of its processes. So nothing talks to each other, uh, which is uh, sometimes has its disadvantages, but actually from a cyber attack, it is pretty, uh, pretty robust because it's impossible to uh, get into because nothing works on the computer system. But the new, the new, system, the new buildings we're designing, uh, we're looking very closely at that, about how you put that firewall between the building management systems and, and the other systems. I mean, there's been, there's been notable cyber attacks recently, for example, getting through the air conditioning system, um, IT system, and then accessing the mainframe of the, of the um, uh, company. Uh, there's been others where they've got into, uh, got into power station through some quite protracted routes through some of the building management systems. So we're looking at putting uh, effective uh, places, uh, effective um, stopping, stoppages to that in the future. And this is obviously an example of a pedestrian protection. It doesn't have to look like that. I mean, that was put in some time ago. Then there have been some really innovative uh, products on the market now, and some really innovative thinking about how to protect against, um, against vehicle attacks. And there's been, uh, there's been some examples of, of public art being used, being examples of branding, of company branding, and, and um, uh, cycle racks, bus shelters, all being used, which can de defend against pedestrian attacks. And to be honest, a lot of it is... Um, 
is look, putting yourself in the place of the victim and the attacker and looking at what, they, uh, what the attacker can see. Because we know from Westminster Bridge, actually psychologically, the guy veered off the pavement to avoid a temporary road sign and then veered back onto the pavement again. So that temporary road sign would have done nothing, wouldn't have stopped his, uh, his progress at all, wouldn't have taken any speed out of the vehicle at all. But psychologically, he didn't want to drive through that temporary road sign. So he drove off the road, drove back on again. In Stockholm, where a large, large uh, goods vehicle was used relatively recently, there's some good evidence there that the casualty number would have been a lot higher, but because the um, driver was crashing through, not PAS 68 stuff or their equivalent, but crashing through things like benches, cycle racks, rubbish bins, street signage, that, that enabled people to come aware of that because they could hear that. It was obvious that there's something out of, the, out of the ordinary. It was obviously something disturbing the environment. They heard that. And, and there's good evidence a lot of people managed to get off the street, get themselves into shops and other buildings, and get out of his path, and therefore reduce the casualty. So it's just, it's just food to thought. But everything's a trade-off. Again, you know, some people might view that as really intrusive and really ugly, but then if you had an outer perimeter where you were able to put some traffic calming measures in place with some chicanes or something else to where, where you had some good technical... Um, research indicating that, that, that the maximum speed a vehicle could reach down that section is X amount and therefore unlikely to cause fatalities, then you could maybe go ease back a bit on that and, and go for something slightly different. Okay, and this is, uh, again, you know, this, this, is a, this is a bit sort of Heath Robinson, but this is what we did to protect Canada Park because we could do that in six hours flat. We put a load of planters there. They're not PAS 68 rated. They're not anchored into the pavement. But what they do have is a tonne and a half of topsoil in each... Uh, Planter plus the uh, plus the weight of the structure, so that would clearly, to any you know any layman, uh, would look at least a visual deterrent and probably a very significant to anything other than the largest of vehicles, very significant um, barrier to preventing people getting into that park, where we have 1,500 people a few hours later enjoying a, a concert. So um, it's all about identifying the risks early, horizon scanning for changes. I've spoke to you, spoken to you about our, our key risks, but actually, who's to say in a week's time we're not here talking about the provisional uh, or distant Republicans uh, starting again? Who's to say that in a couple of weeks' time they haven't worked out how to commit a hydrogen sulphide attack where they've put, they've put some um, constituent parts together from, from bits they bought on Amazon and actually delivered it in sufficient concentration to cause a lethal attack? Because then we'd be sitting here talking about how we have hermetically sealed buildings, how we turn the HVAC system off and, and those sort of things. But you can only go with the available information and, and, and the greatest risk. So we work to provide the best overall security solution with the local authority. We use the CTSAs really heavily, a really good resource for us, and we regularly meet with the CTSAs. Uh, and uh, we work with the architects, engineers and the design team before, before we start. So, you know, just to, to finish off... Uh, on a, a couple of uh, sort of practical examples. Um, don't be in any doubt about the level of scrutiny from buyers and people looking to rent the buildings. Uh, if you've got underground parking or an unscreened vehicle facility, you can expect them to go into intricate detail about what that blast protection is, separating the underground car park and the main working area of the building. Uh, where's the building control room? If it's in an area that's gonna get, gonna get um, disrupted with an IED attack or marauding threat, then you can expect them to be really intrusive about where your backup facilities are. Um, have the building, air, building construction in vulnerable areas been chosen to reduce uh, fragmentation? And about shelter in place and evacuation areas, and about the communication process as well. Have you got an inbuilt lockdown process where somebody can press a button, or are you going to trust somebody on £12 an hour, perhaps, to risk their life running around with a set of keys and locking the doors? Have you got lifts that you can press one button and get put out of action to deny access to the bulk of the building for, for an attacker? And about the shelter in place, you know, it's increasingly getting that staff confidence that if something happens outside, the best place for them to stay is inside and maintaining their confidence. Do you need to have a, a, a planned in uh, um, speaker system to communicate with those staff? And we know that after Borough Market, the run high tell process is really, really effective there. It's the first time it's been really properly used really effective in the, in the uh, UK. But then the problems in the aftermath of that is that 24 hours later, hotels, and there was one particular hotel that sort of opened their doors and did the right thing and let everyone in, uh, 24 hours later, people were find, still found hiding in the uh, wardrobes because, uh, because no one could tell them it was safe to come out again. So do you need a, do you need a proper, credible, built-in PA system to go through there? So we've got perhaps insurance incentives. I don't know. It's not my area of... Uh, uh, sort of expertise, could enhance marketability definitely, showcase capability, 
uh, increased operational effectiveness, and that's joined in between effective um, personnel, effective systems, and it's cost effective to do this at design stage. I mentioned the, the cost to uh, do this at One Canada Square. We have, we have messed up in, in the past, uh, in Canary Wharf in the estate, where we put in systems which aren't effectively secured, and uh, it's cost us because we've had to put a security officer there. So the cost of putting a security officer 24-7 on a car park entrance or a loading bay entrance is, in, in our current rates, £136,000 a year. So it's a, it's a costly mistake to, to make. And finally, I'm just going to show this bit of video. And I, I don't, I'm conscious there might be some sensitivities about this because it's, it's an accident from the emergency services. So what it was, an emergency service crew responding you know, in good faith to an emergency on the estate. And, um, uh, and they had a crash. Uh, and luckily, no one was seriously injured. But there's a couple of um, tourists who are uh, just off to the left-hand side where you see the Barclays uh, scenario there, who are walking around completely oblivious, I think they're on their phones, when, when the, the vehicle is approaching them. It just shows the effectiveness of, of these bollards. And it also shows that if these had gone directly in front of the building, how long would that have put that building out of, it, out of action for? It may have been 24 hours, 48 hours. If the fatalities, it may have been longer. But certainly the couple of tourists, they came to see the bright lights of Canary Wharf. Uh, for a day, but w what they didn't anticipate was how close range they'd be seeing the, the blue flashing lights as the, uh, as the fire engine approached them. With the mouse. Job to stop the mouse. You can't see on the Right, so that's, um, that's well outside the expectation of those bollards because I, think, I, I don't know what the weight of a fully laden fire engine is. I think it's probably about 11 tonnes. Um, but the only damage was the, was the ornamental surround to those bollards. The rest of the bollards, the, the bollards didn't shift at all. But this shows you the value of that. And it, whether it's an Uber driver in Exhibition Road or a London taxi driver in Covent Garden, it just shows you that it does save lives because undoubtedly um, that vehicle would have hit the two, the two tourists had it come in at a, at a more direct angle and not been fended off. Thank you very much.